Okay. Well, thanks, Catherine. Um, so my name is Sam Dillman. I'm a clinical assistant professor at UW Health at American Family Children's Hospital in the emergency department there. Um, and so I um, came up with a lecture for you guys today talking about pediatric fever of unknown origin, um, which is a very broad discussion. And so we'll try to narrow it down a little bit as well too throughout the day. Um, if you guys have any questions along the discussion, I'm more than happy to pause and chat during that time because there's a lot of different directions that we'll be going today with the talk. Um, so the objectives, we'll spend about 20 minutes talking about the systemic, uh, the systematic approach in, of evaluation and management of fever of unknown origin. What's the workup? What kind of exam features should you be looking at, et cetera? And then I want to go through a handful of specific diagnoses, um, whether they're diagnoses that are really hard to make or maybe are even the poster child of fever of unknown origin, such as Kawasaki disease. So I wanted to be able to have you guys recognize the clinical findings associated with Kawasaki disease. Um, I want to talk about pediatric throat infections because that differential is pretty broad and it's probably a very common complaint that you guys will see in your practice. And then specifically regarding throat infections, I want to talk about Epstein-Barr virus as well too, because it's one of those viruses that can actually cause prolonged fever. Um, which when we get into this category of fever of unknown origin. And then two diagnoses that are really hard to make, even for myself clinically, one would be bacterial sinusitis versus the child that has just recurrent upper respiratory viral infections, especially the daycare child that is, lives in the ever living cesspool of viruses. And then finally, understanding the difficulties with diagnosing mycoplasma pneumonia or an atypical pneumonia, and then the um, complications as far as determining what kind of treatment you do when you are diagnosing a patient with pneumonia as a broad definition. So we'll get started um, with the systematic approach to fever. So in regards to pediatric patients with fever, infants and young children do maintain higher temperatures, and that's mainly due to their higher body surface area. A fever is defined by a core temperature of at least 38 degrees Celsius, which is actually really important when we're talking with families. And I am kind of someone as a stickler for asking parents exactly what the temperature is, because a lot of times parents will say, oh, my child's temp was 99 uh, via forehead thermometer. And they're calling that a fever when they say their child's been having like two weeks of fever. And so really kind of seeing if it A is a core temperature, then B seeing how high the temperature is because a lot of external factors can cause your temperature to be in that quote unquote low grade range. Um, most cases of fever are due to self-limited viral infections. Most fevers are um, due to specifically RNA viruses. Um, we've kind of learned more about DNA and RNA viruses with the advent of COVID-19 but those RNA viruses have a shorter replication cycle. And so they have usually two to three days of fever. And so the duration of fever, I always tell parents is the thing I actually care about the most as far as thinking about a child with fever and then if they're well appearing or not, because there's tons of viral infections that can actually cause high fever. And it doesn't put me in one category up over another and the duration does. Um, it's kind of funny. I was scrolling through Reddit today and I had a subreddit um, that's just a science one and they actually had an article about fish and how fish have um, evolutionary advantages to having fever and that they heal and repair quicker um, when they do have fever and they're not treated for their fever which is it was from Alberta and it you know it wasn't a great study but it was kind of funny that that popped up on my feed this morning but anyways bacterial and viruses they are heat sensitive and exhibit temperature dependent toxin production. And so fevers help with immune system mobilization, lymphocyte transformation, um, lysosome and neutrophil activity, and then phagocytosis as well too. And so I always tell parents that fevers in and of themselves aren't a bad thing, uh, but they do make a child feel really crummy. And once you treat their fever, they'll feel a lot better. So for the classic definition of fever of unknown origin it is classically defined by a fever lasting longer than eight days without a clear source. Um, a lot of times we really start thinking about that diagnosis more on day 
five of illness or four um, of fever if you're having that true fever. Because like I said, most of those viral infections have that um, two to three day presentation of fever. Differential is very broad. Infectious is still the most likely um, source for having a prolonged fever, uh, but it includes autoimmune, oncologic, neurologic, and genetic causes. Um, as far as the um, pattern of fever, that can sometimes give you some clues. So like an intermittent fever, which would be kind of classically a tuberculosis type picture. Um, if you have like a relapsing fever where it stays persistent for an extended period of time, you can think about re, uh, like a rat bite fever, remittent, which is a fever that never goes away, which would be like endocarditis, JIA, other guys, or then there's um, sustained fevers, which could be like a pyogenic abscess, for example. So there's certain patterns that can put you in certain differential diagnoses. Um, they did a case report um, looking at, or a retrospective study looking at a bunch of kids that had prolonged fever of unknown origin, and essentially um, over 50% were infection, and then 23% didn't have a diagnosis in the day. The fever just went away, and no one ever found out what the actual cause was. That's changing now more and more with the more um, broad viral testing that we're uh, being exposed to in our clinical um, training grounds at this point. Uh, other causes included um, malignancy in 6% of kids when this study was done, uh, collagen vascular disease, which includes those autoimmune type diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, JIA, things like that. And then um, non-infectious causes as well too, which equated to 11%, which is really a catch-all of a bunch of other things. As far as common diagnoses with this study. It depended if they were in the developed country or if they were in a developing country. So tuberculosis, typhoid fever were those diagnoses that are more common in developing countries for prolonged fever. And then um, Barnella, um, osteomyelitis, things like that were those other um, infectious causes that we think of that cause prolonged fever. And then urinary tract infection was one of those ones that was uh, common in both the developing and underdeveloped countries. So this is a really exhaustive list of fear of unknown origin. And so I'm not gonna read through every single one of these, but I think it's important to kind of highlight some of the things, especially locally, as far as what we think of. Um, we think about a lot of um, tick-borne illnesses and um, we think about Lyme disease a lot of times, which doesn't always have prolonged fever associated with it. But then there's a lot of other ticks or uh, rickettsial uh, presentations that cause prolonged fever if they do have a travel history associated with them. Blastomycosis is one of those fungal pneumonias that is something that we see in Wisconsin. So something to think about in that standpoint. We'll talk about a little bit about this when we talk about Epstein-Barr virus later, but a lot of these viruses are actually DNA-based viruses that have that longer um, cycle where they can have fever for seven to 10 days. So adenovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, enterovirus, and a lot of these viruses actually have higher spiking fevers as well too. Um, I just wanna make a brief comment on oncologic because it's one of those ones that parents will Google and have a lot of concern if, if their child has cancer because they read that fever, um, and maybe having less activity puts them in that category. Um, and so you can really um, ask families what they're most concerned about. I use that question a lot of times when I'm talking with families about what brought you in today? What was something that you even Googled or what were you concerned about? And so in regards to the oncologic concerns, I really rely on B symptoms and then their exam in terms of their lymphadenopathy, especially for lymphoma. 80% of kids with lymphoma will have abnormal lymph lymphadenopathy. If they have supraclavicular lymphadenopathy, lymph nodes in their axillary area or in their inguinal area, those would be more concerning um, locations versus just the nodes are in the in that anterior and posterior cervical chain if they have weight loss that puts me on that thought process as well too and that also puts me in the uh, potential differential diagnosis for like an inflammatory bowel disease um, and then 75 percent will have a medial sinal mass with lymphoma and so getting a chest x-ray if you have that concern is a good quick um, workup that you can do as well too
Um, so let's jump to the next slide. I also want to put this on here as well, too, because I think it's important to ask about travel history and then exposure to animals as well. Um, we really see a lot of Bartonella with like cat scratch disease that's causing prolonged fever. Um, and then the tick-borne illnesses, which we already kind of talked about, where um, certain travel histories will help us understand if there's a zoonotic cause for their fever. And these slides will be emailed to you, so you can look through these kind of at your own leisure, but it's not worth reading through all these specific um, infections. So how do we approach fever of unknown origin? So the exam is really the most important thing that you should focus on. And then in addition to the history, which we already talked about, is this a true, indeed a true persistent fever? Um, and then what else as far as the symptoms that the child is presenting with can help kind of navigate which direction you go? There's actually good evidence to suggest that they've looked at kids with prolonged fever and a child with a completely normal exam is highly indicative of a benign underlying cause. And so an ill-appearing child really changes your thought process as far as how you work up these patients. But a normal exam for your guys' information is something that should be reassuring to you at that time. Um, so as far as labs, I think the standard should really include a CBC with differential urine studies and a complete metabolic panel. Um, the urine being the most important thing, a lot of times once I get to that past that two to three days of fever, um, especially in a female patient or a patient that's at higher risk for urinary tract infection, um, a, the urine study is the first thing I jump to. Um, because a lot of times kids can present with exclusively fever without the source of having like that snotty runny nose. Um, the question about acute phase reactants is, uh, I think, a good one because there's a lot of differing opinions about how to approach those labs, um, including like a CRP or a ferritin or an ESR. Um, it should be helpful in the context of knowing the relative elevation, but not knowing what their baseline is. And then a lot of viral infections can cause a slight elevation in their CRP. And so you just be wary about trying to interpret what that study is showing for you. And so in the context of ruling out an osteomyelitis, there's good evidence for those musculoskeletal infections that are hard to um, assess just based off of external examination. Those laboratory values can be helpful. Um, procalcitonin is another one that is more specific for bacterial infection, which we have started to use for the febrile neonates, um, which there's been a lot of changes in the evidence and then recommendations on that front. And that this talk is not about that, but if you guys have any questions about that presentation or if there was ever interest in having a talk about that, I'd be happy to discuss that further, uh, but outside the scope of this talk today. Um, like I said, ferritin is another acute phase reactant. It's really um, helpful maybe in the oncologic um, autoimmune processes, and we use it as part of our criteria for HLH, for example. And so it does have a role in certain contexts, but another one that can be acutely elevated in a lot of benign viral infections as well, too. Um, so, um, as far as kind of the other steps that you should do as far as workup, this is something that gets missed a lot of times with stopping all unnecessary medications. Ibuprofen can even cause a drug fever, which I honestly forget a lot of times as well too. Uh, but taking all those drugs off the table can help because if a parent's been giving ibuprofen for seven days straight and it's not breaking their fever, it's probably not gonna be something that you should be continuing at that point. So usually once a drug is discontinued, Fevers usually go away 24 hours after that. Um, if they have multiple drugs on board, eliminating one at a time is maybe a good approach as well, too. Um, and then as far as imaging goes, like I said, chest x-ray usually is something that I use as part of my workup if I really don't have a true source. But if a child does not have cough and they don't have concern for um, lymphoma, for example, um, there maybe is an indication to do that. Um, especially because a lot of times chest x-ray leg uh, findings lag when you're looking for a pneumonia, for example. And you really need to let the exam and the symptoms dictate the imaging. Are you worried about an osteomyelitis, for example? So then you maybe have to do um, MRI imaging of a certain extremity if they're not walking. 
or if you're concerned about a septic joint doing an ultrasound. Um, and so it really need to know um, what you're looking for to determine how you're going to image. Um, are you worried about a retropharyngeal abscess with throat pain, which we'll talk about in a little bit? So really letting that exam be your guide, which is not very helpful when you're kind of trying to give a talk as far as recommendations, but you really should try to think about what um, what symptoms and exam findings should dictate where you go next. This is um, pulled from the American County of Pediatrics as far as their recommendations of how to follow up a fever of unknown origin. It's a lot of what we've already kind of talked about. Um, and so if a patient has fever for eight days, like I said, you can kind of put this in the category of five-ish days um, is usually how I read my practice. Um, and so if you have a well-appearing child, um, then the workup is pretty much what we talked about, the CBC, the CMP, a urinalysis, x-rays is indicated, and then observation and serial exams. Um, if you have a source that you can identify after that workup, you can treat the source, or then you need to go to this categorical workup, which I was essentially talking about as far as your exam and which way do you go. And so like if you're worried about infectious endocarditis, osteomyelitis, do those inflammatory markers. If you're worried about meningitis, you do it a lumbar puncture. If you're worried about a rheumatological cause, you can get ANAs and C3s and C4s um, and thyroid function tests. Um, and then if oncologic, it's getting these laboratory evaluations, including a chest radiograph and holding steroids, which we'll talk about a little bit in regards to um, treatment modalities for fever of unknown origin. Um, and then referral to a specialist or a tertiary center, depending on what your exam and workup shows. In a non-well-appearing uh, non child, you know, the really the calculus changes a really a drastic amount. Um, you do a lot of the same things over here, but cultures are included, empiric antibiotics as well, too. Um, and then CSF studies if they are truly an ill-appearing child. Does anyone have questions about this algorithm? It's a little bit clunky to look through, but sick versus not sick and then kind of that basic workup that we talked about should be kind of the approach that you have for these patients okay we'll keep moving along so as far as treatment goes there's good evidence to suggest that an otherwise well-appearing child routine use of empiric antibiotics or anti-inflammatory agents is not recommended um there are certain times where like a patient has like a high centaur score for like a strep pharyngitis it would be reasonable to treat in that context but just throwing antibiotics or steroids to the wind can actually be dangerous in regards to resistance patterns for antibiotic therapy and then as far as the steroids go there's a lot of different thoughts about that um I actually got my residency training under Bob Cleveland who actually is the chief author for uh, Nelson in pediatrics, and he always jokes that no one should die without steroids. Um, and so in a ill appearing patient, it's never wrong to give steroids. We, we always worry about the blunting of the immune system with steroids, but immune suppression really should not be part of your thought process with steroid administration because um, short-term corticosteroid use, um, you don't really see immune suppression until 14 to 21 days after. Um, and so if you have high suspicion for an autoimmune or inflammatory condition, such as lupus or JA, um, and you don't, and you think they're ill appearing, giving steroids isn't wrong, um, but you usually have time to make that decision as well too. Um, and then as far as the biggest concern that you should probably think about when you're trying to avoid steroids is the effect that you can have on oncologic testing and staging because it can really affect that if you have cancer or malignancy as part of your differential diagnosis. So um, you really just need a diagnosis to start treatment. It's the gist of all that jabbering that I was just doing just now. So now we'll transition to these specific diagnoses, which maybe can give you some more meat and potatoes to kind of how to think about some of these patients that come in to your evaluation. 
So we'll start with Kawasaki disease. Like I said, it's kind of the poster child for undifferentiated fever, um, but it really does have specific diagnostic criteria. So it's one of those ones that you can make that diagnosis at the bedside. Um, so it is a vasculitis of medium sized arteries. And so that matters a lot because there is a preference towards coronary arteries. And so the most serious complication of Kawasaki disease is that dilation of the coronary arteries that which can result in um, cardiac dysfunction. The hospitalization rate was 20 per 100,000 children younger than the age of five years, which is where this presentation classically occurs. Um, there isn't really still a clear etiology for why this happens. Um, they think there's a triggering inflammatory cascade. They've looked at tons of different viral infections and bacterial infections to see if there is a specific trigger. Um, they haven't been able to find anything. They've looked at Epstein-Barr virus, human coronavirus, um, herpes viruses, and so they haven't been able to find anything. And that the thought still remains that there is some kind of um, cascade trigger because we, um, maybe you guys have heard about MISC, which is related to the COVID-19 infection, but it had a lot of overlap with Kawasaki disease as far as this presentation. And it was essentially the, the mean response that occurred after exposure to COVID-19. Um, but still, nonetheless, there isn't been anything that's de determined. And there is some seasonality to it as well, too. And so further amplifying that thought process. We've also thought maybe it is a toxin mediated um, disease in the sense that um, the erythroderma and rash that you see looks like a toxin mediated like strep or staphylococcus, like toxic shock syndrome type presentation. So another potential etiology. Um, the fever is typically of abrupt onset, and it's typically greater than 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so when you hear that story of 99, 100 degree fevers, you can really almost effectively rule out Kawasaki disease. For classic Kawasaki disease, you need four of the five criteria, and you need classically five days of fever. If you have that four or five criteria, you can actually make the diagnosis before the five days of fever, but I most patients fall into the atypical or incomplete Kawasaki disease. And so usually you need that five days of fever before even making that consideration. One of the features that is the most notable just anecdotally when I'm seeing these patients that isn't part of the classic criteria is their irritability. These children are not happy at all. Even after giving antipyretics, they're just very Inconsolable is maybe the wrong word because they're at an age where they're not just crying constantly, but they're just very, very fussy individuals. And so usually you could walk in the room and tell, oh, this kid probably does have Kawasaki with just how fussy they are. Um, so let's talk about some of the criteria. So the first one, and which is my favorite um, criteria of the five, is the um, non exudative conjunctivitis that spares the limbus. And that's because of it being a uh, medium vessel vasculitis. And so you have that perilimbic sparing. So you'll see that classic, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse on the screen, probably not, but you see the classic like white, right just adjacent to the iris of the eye. Uh, let me see if I can get the next slide. Okay. The second one is a, a bucket of oral pharyngeal manifestations. And so uh, diffusely erythematous oral pharynx, red crack lips, and the strawberry tongue, which is the more specific of the three. Um, if you see ulcers or exudates, actually, those are not classically seen in Kawasaki disease. So you're probably in a different um, pathway if you do see those. But you can have concurrent viral infections um, in addition to Kawasaki disease. Uh, the red crack lips is one of those ones that's the least specific, I would say, because a lot of kids will be dehydrated if they're having prolonged fever, and so their lips will inevitably look cracked and dry. Uh, but the papillae on the tongue, which you see on this picture, is one of those ones that's a little bit more specific. As far as rash, it usually per appears within that five days. It starts as desquamation of the, per the perine perineal area, and then it diffuses evolves into a really non-specific rash, a diffuse erythematous maculopapular rash over the trunk of and the extremities of the body. And so this is something we see a lot with other viral infections. And so it is a criteria which is important to note, uh, but it's one that's also a non-specific finding a lot of times. 
You also see erythema and edema of the hands and feet. Um, an important discussion point is that you'll a lot of times hear about the criteria of the peeling from the fingers and the toes, which typically begins two to three weeks after onset of fever. And so it's really not part of the workflow as far as diagnosing Kawasaki disease, because at that point, your fevers have already abated, which most Kawasaki disease, if you never treat it with IVIG, will, the fever will last 11 to 12 days. And so this is usually after the initial um, presentation of Kawasaki disease that you see the peeling, but you'll see the edema and the erythema earlier on. And then the um, fifth criteria is the least common criteria met if you are going to have classic Kawasaki disease. It's unilateral lymphadenopathy in the or, uh, in the neck region, and then it's usually greater than one and a half centimeters. So a large lymph node is what you're going to be looking for. Uh, so this is know. the yeah. Go ahead. Hey, it's, it's Catherine. I'm just going to interrupt you. Your camera oh. like panned down, so. You need to like readjust. Oh, sorry. That's okay. We just wanted to let you know so we see your face. Yeah, I have it on a big screen and then I have the laptop too because I can't. I only have one USB port on my computer, so I apologize about that. Oh, no, I, I just wanted to let you know. Cool, thanks. That's better, right? Yeah. Yes, um, it is. Okay, good. So, like I said, this is really the pathway that most of you guys as providers will find yourself in is the incomplete Kawasaki disease because usually you'll have two or three criteria and then you really do need the five days of fever before you go down this workflow because like we were just talking about with these criteria they're really non-specific and you can see them in other viral infections as well too so infants uh i just saw the chat is there an age that's more prone to getting uh Kawasaki disease yes and so usually children that are under the age of five so before kindergarten and so the classic age range is that like toddler to pre young preschool age that you'll see it so it's less likely in an infant but if you have greater than seven days of fever without other explanation you should be thinking about um kawasaki disease or like hlh for example um which have these like inflammatory responses which don't have a lot of specific um, diagnoses or presentations associated with them. And so this is where you go down this pathway. This was developed with um, infectious disease specialists and then the American Health As or Heart Association as well, too. And this algorithm actually has been shown in retrospect to catch 98% of Kawasaki disease that would have required IDIG therapy. So this is a good um, algorithm to kind of go through and determine if your patient requires an echocardiogram and then potentially IVIG for therapy. And so um, you start with the CRP. I mean, different uh, different children's hospitals have different requirements where you do all the labs. And so this one starts with the CRP. Always be of note of what your institution's um, units are using as far as sometimes it's um, milligrams per deciliter and so sometimes the number will change but in this context it's greater than 30 milligrams per liter or an esr elevated as well too and then you need um essentially um greater three or more laboratory findings after that so anemia thrombocytosis with a platelet count greater than 450,000, a low albumin level an elevated alt um, an elevated white count and then a urine um with white blood cells in the microanalysis. The important part for the urine study is that you actually need a non-catheterized sample, which a lot of times you're dealing with patients that are potty trained at this point, so the temptation is to maybe get a cath sample. But the reason that you get this, what's called sterile pyuria, is that you have sloughing of white blood cells in the urethral tract. And so if you place a, a catheter to get your urine sample, you actually miss out on that potential sloughing of those white blood cells. So you have to have the knowledge that you are tempted to not treat as a urine infection if you don't think there's a urine infection going on. So there's always that rub as far as how you make that decision clinically. Um, and so if they meet these fines and you treat with IVIG, um, there was once upon a time steroids were used. They learned that this was really not part of the, the algorithm. Um, 
and it doesn't have didn't have good outcomes either. And so I'm um, treating with IVIG, getting an echocardiogram to see if there's coronary ar ar artery dilation and then aspirin therapy as well, too. Um, there is certain um, criteria that puts patients at higher risk. So young age, younger than six months, um, puts them at higher risk for significant symptoms. Um, and then if they have significant laboratory derangements, that's been shown as well, too, to have higher risk for coronary artery dilation, which is really what we care about the most. Because otherwise, this is truly a self-limited disease in a lot of ways. Um, does anyone have any questions about Kawasaki disease? I know it's a lot of information to sort through as far as the workup and thought process of it. Okay. Cool. You do have some. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great question. There actually is. Um, so there is a cohort in Japan of patients that have um, a increased risk for having Kawasaki disease, and they've actually shown that siblings are actually more likely to get Kawasaki disease as well, too. And so there is definitely a genetic component to this, and it's one that still isn't understood, even though there has been a lot of research trying to find markers. And I think with the advent of more exome sequencing that's happening um, on our patients and the ability to do it more readily in clinical trials, I think we might get an actual genetic um, cause, but it is something that can be genetically passed, specific, specifically in the Japanese uh, population, but we do see it in Caucasian patients as well, too. Um, great question. All right, so we're going to talk about sore throat next as kind of a catch-all because it's one of those things that it's very commonly seen across emergency departments and outpatient visits uh, throughout the country. So 7.3 million bits, visits a year in children. I've kind of delineated ages as far as thinking about specific diagnoses with the backdrop being that viral pharyngitis is the most likely in even the 5 to 11 in the ALICE and eight groups. But under three-year-olds, uh, viral pharyngitis is almost exclusively the diagnosis that I think of. Um, and then in addition to uh, like a retropharyngeal abscess, which we'll talk about a little bit. There's a lot of competing thoughts about group A strep pharyngitis in an under three-year-old. Where I train in fellowship, they actually wouldn't even let you test for group A strep pharyngitis in an under three-year-old child um, because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they don't think you can colonize enough to actually have pathogenic disease. And then two, they essentially can't get the complications of acute rheumatic fever, post-strep granular nephritis. So that's the really the better evidence for potentially not treating because that's really what we're trying to avoid. Um, when we're treating these because they will be self-limited disease in most contexts, um, but it also will help them feel better too with antibiotic therapy. But with that being said, I actually even had a patient last night that I treated that was under the age of three because they had an older brother that had group A strep pharyngitis. And then there is seasonality to group A strep pharyngitis, which you guys all probably already know at this point. We typically see it in the winter, early spring, and we've seen it these last handful of months, like a month or two. And so if you have the seasonality and you have a sick contact, testing it under the age of three is inappropriate. But just note that most centaur um, scoring um, algorithms and that a lot of institutions actually don't recommend testing under the age of three. That age five to 11, group based strep becomes your most likely diagnosis that they do have a true pharyngitis, especially in the context of belly pain and fever. And then adolescents, you just have, have to start thinking about a gonococcal pharyngitis um, as one of the etiologies for sore throat. Um, this is just a comparison of viral pharyngitis and group A strep. A lot of this is baked into the Centaur score, which you guys are probably familiar with. Um, but the big differences um, include kind of, do you have like these other viral type symptoms, coryza, cough, conjunctivitis, diarrhea, et cetera, and versus group A strep, you have more of the headache, the abdominal pain. Um, you can have that scarlet fever type rash as well too. Um, and so um, those types of symptoms can help you to de delineate between those two diagnoses, which both can have fever as well too, which is why we're talking about these today. Um, there is a whole slew of viral and other bacterial causes for pharyngitis. I left this up here if you guys want to review it 
kind of on your own. I think when we think about persistent fever, we always think about, is there a foreign body? A lot of times it'll be like in the nares more than the posterior oropharynx that's causing persistent fever from like a pseudo sinusitis from a foreign body. Um, and then malignancy as well too. And something to think about as far as like persistent fevers, because a lot of these um, infections will have shorter periods of fever other than those DNA viruses that we talked about. So I want to briefly talk about ref retropharyngeal abscess because that's one of these diagnoses that maybe sometimes can be a little bit harder to diagnose and it can have that persistent fever. So its infection is due to lymphatic spread. It's most common in children under the age of six. Um, you'll see the fever, sore throat, and poor feeding. A lot of these younger children though, can't verbalize that they are having indeed sore throat. And so fever, poor feeding, you have larger lymph nodes, maybe they have some limited mobility of their neck or fullness of their neck. You should have a low threshold to be doing some more advanced imaging, either with starting with an X-ray or if I have high enough suspicion getting a CT of the, the neck. Um, I get a lot of calls um, from outside facilities saying that they have a three or four year old or a six year old with a peritonsillar abscess. And the reality is, is that they're probably more likely diagnosing either just a uh, phlegmon or, or a larger tonsillar bed um, consistent with either group A strep pharyngitis or a viral pharyngitis um, versus it actually truly being the peritonsillar space. So in the adult patients, we see ton, they see tons of peritonsillar abscesses, but we see it in the teenage population as well too, where it's just lateral to that tonsillar bed. Um, and so if I hear that story, a peritonsillar abscess in a child um, that's in young school age, it's pretty much a diagnosis we don't see at all. Um, and so for retropharyngeal abscess, um, we kind of already talked about this, but it's the neck pain or stiffness. They'll have potentially some drooling. They'll have that cervical lymphadenopathy. So sometimes it's a little bit harder to diagnose, but if you have that suspicion that you can start with an inspiratory lateral neck X radiograph, you need that inspiratory film to really see that um, prevertebral um soft tissue space so you can see how full this is here um, and then you can sometimes have the loss of your normal cervical lord lordosis as well too that can help indicate that but if you end up diagnosing an x-ray most of the time your um friendly otolaryngologist is going to want a ct scan to better characterize and see if drainage is required unlike peritonsillar abscess that were used that always uh require aspiration of the abscess. A lot of times retropharyngeal abscesses are medically treated with IV antibiotics. Um, and so that's what they start with. Usually we'll trend inflammatory markers as an inpatient. Um, and then sometimes um, they will decide to drain that said abscess. Um, you can get local extension um, and then um, you can have airway obstruction as well too as like a significant complication of a retropharyngeal abscess. So expanding past the um, sore throats, I wanna talk a little bit about Epstein-Barr virus because it's one of those viruses that's really hard to diagnose um, clinically a lot of times. Um, it can be frustrating for parents too, or families as well too because it can be a very debilitating disease in a lot of ways. Um, so it's classically called the kissing disease because it's transmitted via saliva or genital secretions. Um, it can shed for up to six months and then usually have a lifelong infection. It's part of the herpes virus family. Um, the virus classically presents in from the ages of four to 40. Um, and then other, we'll talk mainly about it, infectious mononucleosis, which includes fever, sore throat, malaise, lymphadenopathy, and splenomegaly. Um, but it's important to know with EBV that it can actually contribute to malignancies, including nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Burkitt lymphoma, Hodgkin disease, and leomyosarcoma. But immunosuppression also can react to the disease. You can get like a pneumonitis, PTLS, or hairy leukoplakia. And so um, really thinking about all the different things that EBV can do is important when you're thinking about patients in certain populations. Um, so the clinical aspects, the in incubation period in adolescence is usually 30 to 50 days. Um, 
the primary EBV infection in young children is really hard to diagnose. It's really nonspecific fever, sometimes sore throat. 90% will have generalized lymphadenopathy. 50% will have splenomegaly, which I would actually anecdotally think that's a little high. Um, I think it's less than that. But sometimes I'll admit myself that my examination skills for getting splenomegaly, if it's very subtle, is sometimes difficult. Um, one of the most important uh, clinical aspects is actually the a rash that we see after amoxicillin exposure. A lot of these kids actually get diagnosed with group based up pharyngitis because there's actually a 5% carrier rate for patients that have mononucleosis with group A strep. And so um, they'll have sore throat, you get swabbed, they're a carrier, and then they get amoxicillin, and then you'll see this rash come out. It's a copper colored pruritic maculopapular rash. That's immune mediated and requires no specific treatment other than discontinuation of the antibiotic until the eruption resolves. Um, in regards to the lymphadenopathy, epitrochular lymphadenopathy is traditionally suggested of infectious, infectious mononucleosis. Um, and that's typically uncommon for other source uh, uh, causes of lymphadenopathy. So something just to think about. Um, so let me go to the next slide. As far as diagnosis, um, we'll talk about antibody testing in the next slide, but I wanted to briefly talk about if you do end up doing a CBC, um, two thirds of your differential will be lymphos lymphocytes with 20 to 40% 40 40 being atypical lymphocytes, um, which does have some specificity to it. You can see that in uh, CMV infection, toxoplasmosis, hepatitis, uh, roseola, rubella, mumps, um, mycoplasma. And so it's some of, some of those things can help narrow the differential diagnosis if you see a larger percentage of atypical lymphs. You'll a lot of times see mild thrombocytopenia and then your transaminases may be elevated, but it's never really clinically relevant as far as your liver function itself. So diagnosis, this is probably where a lot of the questions will typically come up when we think about Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and so the classic monospot testing is um, also referred to as heterophile testing. It's not good for testing in young children because it's less than 50% sensitive. And so it's not really a good test at all. Um, and then um, it can be positive, as you can see with the curves here, up to two years. Um, and so sometimes it's not the best test um, when you're trying to diagnose a patient with mononucleosis. It is 90% sensitive for adults, but the other important piece is that a lot of times it doesn't become positive until like at least a week of symptoms. And so if you're catching them in that first seven days of fever and you're doing the monospot test, it might not give you the diagnosis that you're looking for. Um, and so um, the really the better test that I will use a lot of times if I actually do have a high suspicion um, is doing EBV antibody testing. Um, and it's something I actually forgot to mention when I was talking about the fever of unknown origin workup is that we've really expanded our ability to test for a lot of different viruses um, with, we have like a rapid biofire for um, an expanded viral panel for patients. And so EBV isn't included on that, but you can do these IgM testing um, which will show up a little quicker than the heterophile antibody test. And then it's really more specific for acute infection as well, too. And so you'll see that there is still a spike in children under the age of four, and then an IgM spike for children of four, because they do still make more antibodies if they're older than four, but it's really more pathogenic in the, in the older than four-year-old range. And so if your laboratory has that capability, it's a good option as far as diagnosing where the um, infectious disease specialists even say that the model spot test isn't a great test, even though we still use it in a lot of contexts. As far as management goes, it really is supportive care. So it's more on a good to know basis a lot of times. No contact sports for at least two to three weeks. I've seen pretty variable practice styles as far as how long they don't play for, um, especially if it is a higher risk. Um, activity like football or hockey. If they still have splenomegaly, it's reasonable not to treat. But there was a study that sh was done um, that showed that most ruptures actually happen during the second week of disease um, at a rate still less than 0.5%. So it's really low likelihood. And so I think you're saying like two months out, I think you're being overly conservative at that point. Um, and then as far as like other treatment modalities, it is a herpes virus. So like 
there was always this thought, could acyclovir help? And so there's been studies done that shows that it doesn't reduce the severity or duration of illness. Um, and then steroids are indicated in certain scenarios with EBV, um, like such as upper airway expression, obstruction, thrombocytopenia complicated by significant bleeding, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, seizures, meningitis, which are really less likely presentations of EBV. Uh, but in view of the potential unknown hazards of immunosuppression for a virus that can actually have oncologic complications, which we talked about when we were talking about our fever of unknown origin piece, um, it shouldn't be used routinely in, on complications of infectious mononucleosis. And I think that goes against the grain a little bit, especially because the adult literature has a lot of good evidence for uh, viral pharyngitis or strep pharyngitis having uh, significant clinical improvement from sore throat and ability to tolerate oral intake um, with steroid immunization uh, utilization. But if you do think it's EBV, I think it's a little bit better to be thoughtful about avoiding steroid therapy potentially. All right, so we're on the home stretch here. Hopefully, I'll get through these quicker. Sorry, I'm taking a little bit longer than I anticipated. But the last two uh, things I want to talk about are diagnoses that actually myself personally I have a hard time making um, and always have to be thoughtful about should I be making these diagnoses or not. And so the first one is acute bacterial sinusitis. So surprisingly, up to 10% of viral URIs are actually complicated by acute bacterial sinusitis. And the pathogenesis is related to three factors. One is sinus obstruction, um, and then you get that ciliary dysfunction and then thickening of sinus secretion. So it, I always like, kind of equate it to similar to an ear infection. You have that stasis of fluid behind the tympanic membrane and you don't have the ability to drain it properly with their short eustachian tube. And so that stasis leads to a uh, breeding of infection or similar to a urine infection where the urine has stasis from the constipation, for example, and that stasis leads to brewing of fun bugs. Um, Similar to otitis media actually has similar pathogens as well too. With the advent of our expanded streptococcus um, vaccinations, that has gone down from like roughly 56% to 41%, um, whereas Haemophilus non-typable H flu has actually gone up to about 50%, 57% of the time. And then Moraxella is about 10% of the pathogens. Um, as far as age, you know, a lot of infectious disease doctors will tell you that you shouldn't really be making a diagnosis of sinusitis under the age of two or even three because A, they'll probably have an ear infection before they would have a true sinusitis, and B, because they really don't develop their frontal sinuses, which is the most common location for a sinusitis until the age of five. Their ethmoid sinuses are present at birth, but they're very tiny as well, too, so they're unlikely to have um, plugging and obstruction of those areas. Um, and so more likely have an ear infection early on, which it kind of, you could bill, like I said, as a sinusitis technically. Um, but if they still meet criteria, it's not unreasonable to treat, which we'll talk about right now. Um, so the clinical presentation and criteria of acute bacterial sinusitis, this is developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. If there's nasal discharge, congestion, or cough for greater than 10 days without improvement, um, you can consider um, treating for acute bacterial sinusitis. It's one of those things where um, cough, you'll have post-viral cough for a couple of weeks, so I just wouldn't let cough alone be the um, decision-making tool for persistent symptoms. And then if they have the classic um, presentation where they have the particular pattern where it starts as clear as water, it becomes thicker and mucoid, and then it kind of reduces where it becomes watery again and is simply drying out, that kind of timeline makes it less likely to be a bacterial sinusitis. If you have a temperature greater than 38.5 degrees Celsius um, with really green or nasty looking um, rhinorrhea for at least three days, that'd be meeting clinical criteria, um, which is one that maybe is a little bit easier to make because if you're having those high fevers and you're really just like really having that purulent rhinorrhea is something to think about. And then worsening of symptoms, and this is one of the hardest ones to make of the three criteria because a lot of kids, like I said, live in the cesspool that is daycare. And so that worsening nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, cough after a three or four day period of improved symptoms. So is it a second viral infection that they picked up? And that's usually where I come to the conclusion, especially in a well impairing child. Um, and so a lot of times parents are coming more in for the cough or other things, but 
um, persistent um, congestion that worsens like this, it's something that you can consider for the diagnosis. Um, a lot of patients will present with tooth pain, fever, um, face pain, which is more common in the older population as well, too. Um, you've probably done CT scans in the past of the sinuses, and a lot of times they will show a sinusitis. And so it kind of goes to the fact that we may be underdiagnosing some of these patients. Um, but is it indeed a viral etiology versus some bacterial cause? Um, as far as treatment goes, um, the recommendation from the AEP is actually to do high dose augmentin because of the increased um, prevalence of non-typable H flu, which is a little funny given that we still do amoxicillin on this first line for ear infections. Um, we do the high dose for the penicillin binding protein resistance patterns and that the, the um, non-typable H flu has more and more penicillinase resistance. And so that's why we add the clavulonic acid. As far as second line, it becomes a little bit trickier. Um, cephalosporins um, do have some potential resistance patterns, and then levofloxacin, um, which has been sometimes looked probably upon for giving in pediatrics, has become a more popular drug as a second line medication. Um, unlike the recent studies that have been done for acute otitis media, there actually has been randomized double blind studies that show that actually treating with antibiotics, if they do meet clinical criteria, actually does improve their symptoms quicker. And so um, that's really kind of how I think about treatment is that I really try to stick with augmentin as far as um, treating if I'm do, doing a sinusitis type picture. I can talk more about ear infections and treatment if you guys have questions afterwards, but I'm going to try to just quickly go through mycoplasma and just finish up for you guys, okay? Um, so mycoplasma is a diagnosis that leads to what's called an atypical pneumonia. It causes 20% of cases in school-aged children for pneumonia. It's less common in preschool-aged children where you get more of like a classic bacterial community-acquired pneumonia versus like a viral infection. It's classically presents in the winter, winter. There are epidemics every three to seven years. So just knowing your local patterns of um, mycoplasma is helpful to understand um, if there is an increased risk for a patient having it. It really has non-specific symptoms. A lot of times, cough, fever, malaise, headache. Uh, I've had plenty of patients when I was in my residency training that would show up for fever of unknown origin. And they would get their full viral panel workup or um, have further testing and then their mycoplasma would be positive. And so it's one of those ones that will present with a persistent fever. It's been classically known to actually exacerbate asthma exacerbations. Um, and then it can actually ca cause classic classic rashes in the form of mucositis, erythema multiforme, and then Steven Johnson syndrome. Um, and they can cause autoimmune anemia. We'll talk about this with treatment a little bit, but mycoplasma is unique in that it has no cell wall. Um, which leads to its inability to be seen on gram saying, and then it also limits its um, treatment options as well, too. So mycoplasma does really have nonspecific radiographs. Uh, the most common findings is peribronchular, perivascular interstitial infiltrates, um, which was seen in once a up to 50% of patients. Um, and then you also may see some airspace consolidations. You can, to make it even more frustrating, you can see unilobular disease, um, and then you can also have pleural fusion, which is more classic for your run-of-the-mill community acquired pneumonia. And so it really is very nonspecific is the best way to put it. As far as testing goes, it really depends on the assay that you're using, um, but there is PCR testing um, that can be performed that's gotten better and better. And like I said, this is one of those ones that's on our biofire testing, actually. Young children might not mount an immune response, um, but there's not a clear cut recommendation for best practices regarding diagnostic testing. And then last but not least, it's really difficult to pick the right treatment because, like I said, uh, mycoplasma doesn't have a cell wall. And so um, your typical penicillin type drugs um, don't have the same effect. And so they won't work. And so azithromycin is the standard of care treatment. It's a favorite among adult providers because it does have anti-inflammatory effects. So it's almost like giving a patient a steroid, but because it's been used so frequently, there is some resistance developing, particularly against your typical staph and streptococcus. Um, and so it used to be able to be used for 
do it by step, but a lot of times now there is some resistance for it, even with something that's a pretty weak bacteria. Um, and so you can use doxy or levofloxacin as a second line, but it's important to know that if you actually think you are treating a community acquired pneumonia, you should really be using amoxicillin or augmentin as your second line and not azithromycin because it's probably not treating those um, varieties of community acquired pneumonia. So this is something that you might not be able to see as well on the screen, so hopefully you can use this as reference later. But it really focuses on the age of the child because once you're less than five years old, you're more likely to be in the pathway of a community acquired pneumonia or a viral pneumonia. And so if you, in general, um, see a focal infiltrate or your focal crackles or see something focal, you should really focus on doing community acquired pneumonia treatment and not doing azithromycin. Um, I've seen plenty of patients that got put on azithromycin and they had focal wheezing, focal infiltrate, and then they don't get better. Um, and so sticking with treating for acute acquired pneumonia if they're younger or if they um, have focal findings. But then if not, you can go down um, a well-appearing child. You can do watching and waiting or doing testing to see if you want to treat or if um, they've had persistent symptoms empirically treating isn't inappropriate if they have enough features that would be consistent with a mycoplasma pneumonia. So that was a whirlwind of a talk. Um, here are some of my references. I really want to open the floor now for having any kind of conversation just because there was a lot of information from different um, avenues that can be a little bit harder to sort through. So um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy days to listen to me talk and blab. And so um, I'll open the floor now to any questions that anyone might have. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you don't have to use the chat if you don't want to. Oh, you're welcome. Well, no. not seeing any. Okay. Um, I guess you were thorough and you answered everything and nobody had questions. So that's great. Cool. And we so appreciate your time and taking oh, yeah. time to do this. I know, I know you're busy along with the attendees trying to make time for this too. So we, we really thank you. Oh yeah, of course. Anytime. And then if anyone has any questions that come up afterwards, or if you're reviewing the slides and something doesn't make sense, you can email me or reach out to me. I'm happy to chat with anyone as well, too. And that, yeah, I mean, I'm giving the disclaimer that I'm not an infectious disease specialist because a lot of these are infectious presentations, but um, we do see a fair amount of fever of unknown origin. So if you guys have any questions or anecdotal um, thoughts about any patients that you've had, I'm more than happy to chat with you guys about that, too. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Hopefully it wasn't too boring today. So oh, not at all. <laughs> um, Megan, did you want to finish up? Yeah, I'll just add on um, as a reminder, we will be sending out the slides that Sam presented on today, as well as a recording and a short survey just to help us know how we do with these webinars. So look in your email for that coming out today or tomorrow. And thanks again for your time. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good day, everyone. Hey, you too. Bye-bye. Okay.